All right, shifting gears to Dr. Jerome Corsi. He has been a very, very busy man, not just with his best-selling books and WorldNetDaily.com, but his own website as well, Patriot News. Uh, he, of course, uh, has doctorates from uh, Harvard. Uh, he's an economist and a political scientist and has consulted to the highest levels of our government and other governments, a lot of it classified. He has a PhD from Harvard University in political science, 1972. Number two, uh, he, uh, he's, he's written two number one New York Times bestsellers, or maybe it's three uh, and he joins us, JeromeCorsi.com, to give us his expert analysis on what's really going on uh, with Iran. I've tried to read the agreement now that part of it's out, and it just sounds like Obamacare. It sounds like it's a blank check for Iran and the Obama administration to do whatever they want to do. Everybody knows I don't just blindly side with Israel. I look at the facts, and uh, this does not look like a very good deal uh, what's going on, Dr. Corsi? Is this a real political realignment with the Shiites uh, in a civil war against the Sunnis, or is it a triple cross? Dr. Corsi, can you make sense of this with all your high-level sources? Well, well, first of all, the, we don't even know what the agreement really is. I mean, Iran agreed to agree. Iran said that they're going to, it, by the end of June, I have a frame, the framework agreement will be implemented. Now, framework agreement... In, uh, in terms of diplomacy, it means an agreement that structures what the deal is ultimately going to look like. The so a deal on a framework on a framework. So it's like saying someday we're going to draw up a plan for a boat, but we haven't drawn the plan up yet. And this is what the boat's going to look like when we draw up the plan. Unless, of course, we decide to change the plan between now and the final agreement. That's the problem is that all the things Iran said they were going to do, limiting centrifuges, reducing their program, having it open to inspections, are not going to happen today. They're going to happen at the end of June when the agreement is reached. So, I mean, bottom line, is this a screw job and then break it down? Yeah, absolutely, because at the same time, we agreed to start stepwise removing sanctions. And this is what the big disagreement is, that we're saying we're going to start removing the sanctions right now. So Iran still can be enriching uranium, it can still be running a secret program, can ultimately not agree to any of these terms at the end of June, and we will be lifting sanctions in the meantime. So it's a, it's a complete win for Iran, as a complete um, really fooling the American people with the idea that there is an agreement, because in reality, uh, the two sides failed to come to an agreement and had to extend the length of time they're talking. This framework agreement is, you know, there's been a framework agreement on two-state solution in uh, Israel since the Carter administration. So is this Obama just trying to get some type of legacy? Yes, it's, it's an attempt to, it's a public relations effort. It's John Kerry and Obama saying, look at this great lifetime once in a lifetime opportunity we have with Iran to end their nuclear program. But in reality, Iran has not agreed to limit their nuclear program. They've agreed to keep talking about it and said, when we do agree to limit our nuclear program, here's what we think we would do. So in effect, there is no agreement. And in effect, the, tale, the talks failed because Iran in the last hour refused to agree to many of the critical terms and the Obama administration kept making concession after concession and still could not get Iran to agree to even all the concessions that the Obama administration was willing to make. So we have no deal. There really is no deal here on the table at all. There's a deal to have a deal. There's an agreement to have an agreement. That's all we've done. Looking at the larger picture there in the Middle East, North Africa, with ISIS running around and then... The invasions going on in Yemen and other areas seems like all hell's breaking loose. Geopolitically, from your research, what is the real U.S. policy versus the rhetoric and what's going on in the Middle East right now? Well, first of all, the I think the abandonment of Israel is really the, the key story. And when I was in Israel in 2009, I warned the key people in the government that the United States and Obama would abandon Israel, that we would relinquish the historical commitment we had to the Jewish state. And now I think Obama is in open conflict with Netanyahu. I mean, even punishing, I believe, Senator Menendez, who welcomed Netanyahu when he spoke to the joint session of Congress. So you think that that split's real? Oh, absolutely. I think that Obama has no interest in maintaining a Jewish state. Obama wants a two-state solution. He wants the 
gradual erosion of Israel. Uh, there's nothing being maintained in terms of even for the very beginning, the settlements that Israel had that were agreed upon by the Bush administration have been objected to by Obama and continue to be objected to by Obama. And Netanyahu virtually said when he came to the United States in the joint session of Congress that this was a low point in U.S. relations with Israel since 1948. Let, let's pull back Obama on that too, and I want to expand on that. But right. let's just say for the, the whole cause celeb thing and the left in Hollywood and the rest of it, only one thing they love more than trying to take our guns is bashing Israel. Now, I have real criticisms of Israel, and Israel has different governments that come and go. But separate from that, if Israel disappeared, the Arabs are still just going to be killing each other. Uh, the Palestinians, like they did before, will start fighting over who gets that land. Uh, I, I mean, I just don't see what happens if Israel disappears. It's kind of like Nixon said, you won't have me to kick around anymore. What would the world do without Israel to blame for everything? Well, we would reverse and do what we're having now is chaos. I mean, we, first of all, the Obama administration starting in Libya backed the Al Qaeda affiliated militia to depose Gaddafi. We armed, this is what Christopher Stevens was doing when he was in Gaddafi. He was arming the Al Qaeda supported militia. And many of those weapons end up in Syria fighting Assad with the group that ultimately becomes ISIS. So Obama has fostered the Muslim Brotherhood. He supported the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in Egypt under Morsi. There's dozens of Muslim Brotherhood now into the Obama administration at high policy levels. Uh, the Obama administration has tilted decidedly in terms of the Sunni Muslim Brotherhood. But then we turn around and we are working with, uh, you know, uh, fighting Iran. Iran is helping us to fight ISIS in Iraq. We now have the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard, an open force in Iraq, in Tikrit, trying to take Tikrit back. The United States is doing some bombing, but the major force on the ground is Iraqi militia, which again are now Shiite, backed by the Shiite Revolutionary Guard from Iran in Iraq, and we're supporting in that conflict um, Iran. So we're Didn't both Saudi Arabia know opening the door and kicking off the Shiite-Sunni yes. civil war would give Iran the green light to release its more highly trained military teams across the region? Well, it's the, I've said since 2009 that if Israel attacks uh, Iran, the only ally Israel's going to have is going to be Saudi Arabia. And since 2009, Israel and Saudi Arabia have been running military uh, maneuvers. Iran has been re uh, Israel has been rehearsing a strike on Iran, training pilots, preparing logistics. Saudi Arabia would be the force that would help Israel attack Iran. And Saudi Arabia has come closer now to Israel because the Saudis as Sunnis are desperately afraid that if Iran as the Shiites exert regional power, which they're doing, and this agreement with Obama under nuclear weapons just gives Iran more prestige, more power, more money with the lifting of sanctions. Okay, well, let's pull back. I mean, we know there's a major Israel lobby, there's a defense lobby, there's a major global banking lobby that I think is the most dominant. Uh, that really does tend to be financing an anti-Israel movement worldwide to kind of legitimize global government worldwide and the UN through some type of sacrifice of Israel. So separating, uh, you know, let's say I'm an atheist uh, politically on Israel, uh, just looking at it coldly like a political scientist, which you are, wh why does the elite want to start getting rid of Israel? And how do they think they're going to get away with that? Because Israel's got nuclear weapons, a major military, and isn't going to go quietly. I mean, I've heard people say, oh, no, Israel just give up and roll over. I don't see that happening. I mean, is this a larger destabilization program that they think will then force Israel into a confrontation? And then Israel will destabilize the region more? I mean, this just seems like an order out of chaos playbook here that doesn't have an end game. It seems insane. Well, you've got, first of all, I think the globalists have tired of supporting Israel. And are willing to abandon Israel. I don't see any really global, you know, the, the, the one world order crowd, the new world order crowd, and the groups who are pushing one world currency and all the other integrations of economies. They're done using Israel now, just like they're done with the U.S. 
They have no real use in Israel. They don't want to support it any longer. What you've got developing in the Middle East is really a fundamental conflict between Sunnis and Shiites. And the United States seems to be playing, you know, the only, both sides, we're not supporting any of the moderate forces in the Middle East. We're certainly not supporting Israel. And when Israel gets pushed into a corner, and I've said this since I wrote Atomic Iran in 2005, Israel will reach a point where they decide that if Iran's going to be imminently having nuclear weapons, Israel will attack, regardless of the cost and regardless of whether Israel has to use nuclear weapons or not. I mean, we're, we're seeing a, a regional, the, the Middle East has devolved into violent Islamic chaos that is going to be very difficult for most Americans even to come. And it is now being exported at record rates with the yes. political left worshiping it and the ultimate sin is criticizing radical Islam. What is the insane equation there? where places like France are xenophobic against other European cultures and, and, and language, but are importing radical Islam as fast as they can. Well, even in the United States, I mean, the, the surprising thing is that the, for instance, on the left, the feminist movement does not oppose radical Islam, even though it you know, violently discriminates against women, uh, abuses women, uh, and it does so on a, as a, a theological on a theological basis. Yet the American left embraces Islam and ignores all of these atrocities that Islam creates. So you've got a love affair with the left worldwide, and you see it in France, you see it in the European countries. We're also importing a, a large number of Muslims into the United States with the Obama administration. Uh, that's again not being actively reported. We're reporting it at WND, you're reporting it at InfoWars, but in general, uh, the influx of Muslims under the Obama administration and in high policy positions, Muslim Brotherhood in high policy positions uh, in the State Department and the administration throughout has not been adequately covered. Well, sure, and everybody knows that I was against these previous wars and I'm not a, quote, Islamophobe. But, I mean, I went to high school and college with really nice Muslim folks that weren't radical. Some of these earlier waves were really, you know, scientists, engineers, really uh, doctors, neat people. The folks coming in now, and I live in Austin, Texas, uh, are, are Wahhabist. I mean, I talk to them, I see them, I hear them. Uh, yeah. I see them, like, shoving their wife down the street, wearing a hood over her head, bugging their eyes out at me. Uh, I mean, it's, it's getting pretty creepy, and, I mean, I don't want to live in Saudi Arabia. I'm sorry. Well, the, the responsible position should be to support moderate forces within Islam to have a reformation. And they can be found. I mean, LCC in Egypt, for instance, is one of the moderate forces in Islam that could help to get a re-evaluation of the violent nature of radical Islamic terrorism. I mean, what, you know, I think any responsible person is opposed to radical Islamic terrorism rather than Islam itself. We're not going to go to war with a billion people in the world who believe in Islam, most of whom don't want any of this violence at all. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, Bill Maher says they all want violence for most of them. No, that's not true. But the not groups true. taking over do. And I want to talk about that radicalization when we come back with Dr. Jerome Corsi of WND.com. I'm Alex Jones. And now they say all sex is rape, and then they'll never criticize sexual mutilation, radical Islam. And they put movies out with David Cross where they go, Alex Jones is a racist Islamophobe, just randomly in the movie. When I was criticized for being against the Iraq war and all the rest of it, doesn't mean I want to be colonized by radical Islam. Which, if you hadn't looked around, has taken over. Even the UN says Christians are being persecuted at record levels. Why are Christians so low in the government's eye? Why can't Christians get bakeries to put Christian verses on cakes? But the, quote, gays and lesbians can. Because Christianity is seen as the dominant culture, and we're being conquered right now. That's my view. Dr. Corsi is a sociologist, anthropologist, political scientist, uh, well-traveled man. Why is there a major war on Christianity, or do you disagree that there's not one? I mean, look at Lois Lerner not getting in trouble. Well, I think you see it. You've identified it correctly. There is a war on Christianity going on. The left agenda, the agenda of the left sees an opportunity right now to, to get, as it were, a final victory in terms of the culture war, uh, pressing on the LGBT agenda to have you know, various forms of sexual preference be declared a constitutional right so that, you know, what happens to the First Amendment? Well, if you object to this, you are a bigot. Uh, churches, we're going to see 
lawsuits increasingly to tax churches that do not support the LGBT agenda. Uh, around the world, and the Pope has mentioned this as well, the, you're seeing Christians under attack on, and throughout the Middle East, uh, throughout Africa, slaughters of Christians, uh, which are being largely unreported and largely not even taken seriously. The UN, which has largely been, you know, again, very supportive of a radical Islamic agenda, uh, had from the beginning of the Palestinian debate going back, you know, 30 or 40 years, uh, the UN has not speaking up for Christians the way it would be expected to speak up for Islam. And that's because Christians are politically incorrect. Christians it's, need to just roll over and die or become Marxist conduits or, or we will be destroyed. The, the choice are, you know, first, what's acceptable politically is you can be an atheist or you can be, you know, certainly Islam is not being criticized by the left. Uh, but any true Christianity is viewed as uh, being portrayed as bigoted, being, you know, uh, portrayed as out of touch with reality. Well, Christianity is what caused basically the modern renaissance and inclusiveness well, and the reformation as you were getting at. And, and it's just, I mean, they've taken the fruits of that and are now bringing in a totalitarianism. Uh, in closing, what do you make separately? We've been through this before with the ancient Roman Empire. I mean, the ancient Roman Empire had, you know, Christianity was the solution to the violence, the paganism, and the, you know, the anything goes kind of attitude, value relativism, that it produced the chaos of the ancient world and Christianity largely brought the ancient world into a reformation, the enlightenment, and the modern world. Now we're going the opposite direction. We're going back to moral relativism. We're saying that any attitudes people have, regardless of what they want to uh, believe or not believe, or um, sure. have sexually or not have sexually, is within their preference, and they're all constitutionally protected, except if you want to believe in Jesus Christ and profess Christianity. I was so about to say there's that paradox where anything yeah. goes except if we say it doesn't, and then uh -huh. it's totalitarianism. The, well, see, the left is not going to be tolerant. It's not going to be classically liberal. It doesn't believe in a First Amendment. It believes that if you don't adhere to the left's principles, you need to go to thought reform because you are not only incorrect, you're evil, you've got to be crushed, you've got to be abused. That's what they do to you, Alex, and what they do to me on the left, because... These people are sick. Dr. Corsi, I know you've got to go, but we're back in 60 seconds. See if you can do, like, three more minutes to put bookends on this and finish up on where you think Obama's going, this election, the power grabbing. I want to get some final comments, WND.com. I want to get his take on stuff like New York City Council considers allowing non-citizens to vote. Illinois is doing that as well. Court moles receiving and revealing secret government plan to cut cell phone service. I wanted to put bookends on the Iran geopolitical situation. Then I wanted to come back in the next longer 12-minute segment and get into the, the other issues, cover the waterfront. But Dr. Corsi, you know, Boehner was just in Israel, and he said the world's on fire. It was interesting to see him tell the truth for a change as he helps Obama keep Obamacare in and the rest of it. Uh, but but uh, am I wrong, or, or, or is the political elite getting more more reckless or feckless i mean what's going on because i really try to tr track their activities and more and more it seems like they don't know what they're doing well i think you've got the last two years here the obama administration and there's kind of a rush to the finish line to see how many agendas can on the radical left can be put into place uh by fiat by executive order or certainly with a dysfunctional congress unable to oppose Boehner and McConnell and the Senate are not able very effectively to oppose Obama. So the, the left feels it's got a free run to the finish here to open the borders, which they're doing very aggressively, to uh, weaken the support for Israel. I mean, I think the Middle East will continue to descend into chaos, and Iran will now advance to nuclear weapons with more money to support its terrorist activities once the sanctions are lifted. Uh, the international situation is desperate. I think Christians should not even contemplate going to the Middle East for hardly any reason. I mean, still safe to visit Israel, but again, I wouldn't go much beyond Israel in the Middle East. Uh, it's a desperate situation of chaos, and the world is on fire. Uh, you've got Russia in the same time exerting its influence, opposing NATO. 
And I think we're much closer to a nuclear war than we've ever been since maybe uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. And the, and the nature of the nuclear war, I think, is going, it is coming, will be more of a local or regional nuclear war where Russia may use a nuclear weapon against one of the Baltic states or you may end up with an Israel strike on Iran, which turns into a nuclear exchange. These things are possible now. And if Iran gets nuclear weapons or appears to be imminently getting nuclear weapons, all the other countries like Saudi Arabia will begin working immediately with Pakistan to get nuclear weapons. And the entire regional conflict in the Middle East will go from chaos and conventional weapons very quickly to chaos of nuclear weapons. Those are really strong words, but a lot of analysts are saying the same thing. that We've never been in more danger, that this is worse than the Cuban Missile Crisis. You've got the Russians and the United States and Israel trying to legitimize the use of tactical nuclear weapons, which it seems is really hard to keep control of. It's just a crazy time. And then, I'm no fan of Putin, but then you got, I'm really no fan of Soros helping stir up Ukraine. It just seems like America really has lost moral high ground, and we're now just down there with the rest of them. It just seems like a degeneration. Well, the, the chaos, and again, you know, the whole moral relativism of the left, the chaos that comes from uh, the kind of breakdown of structures, moral structures and structures that have traditionally defined the post-war world, uh, we're entering into a very kind of fluid period of time. I mean, I can see, I don't think the EU is going to stay together. I think Greece is on the way out. If the EU begins to break up, we're going to see, you know, again, a return to the problems, the fiscal problems that we had worldwide in 2008, 2009. I think the coming problems with the magnitude of world debt that there is today are going to dwarf what we saw in 2008. And that's my next question. I want to come back on the economy, which you've got a degree in from Harvard, a doctorate. I want to look, Dr. Corsi, at another Harvard alumni, Larry Summers, saying this is why the U.S. lost its superpower status, according to Larry Summers, with the new China Investment Bank. I want to look at the big global view straight ahead with Dr. Jerome Corsi. I'm Alex Jones. Video, it's up on DrudgeReport.com. We're linking to it on Infowars.com. Bees swarm interrupts Obama storytelling. Children scream. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Meanwhile, smart meters to bust water abusers in California. Water company to ration supplies for 26 cities to train you to accept higher prices. That's what that's really all about. More scientists doubt salt as bad for you, as government says. I have a stack of news. I'm going to be getting into some of the news also up on Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. Dr. Jerome Corsi is our guest. Uh, since you are an economist, I wanted to get into this investment bank that first the U.S. wasn't going to be part of. Now it is. That's led by the communist Chinese. Larry Summers come, has come out in an op-ed piece, Zero Hedge has it, and said basically, we haven't joined global government enough. We haven't been enthusiastic enough, even though we've helped lead it. So we're going to be left behind by the Asian Union. Meanwhile, U.S. defense chief says influence, uh, influence at risk without Asia trade pact. That's Reuters. That's what the globalists said in the 70s. We'll create the Asian Union, European Union, American Union. Have those unions compete, run by the same people, getting people to give up more and more of their power to a central group, claiming that'll make us prosperous as we actually become enslaved and signed on to the global derivatives overhang. And that's been the plan since 1976, the Trilateral Commission. And then here's Larry Summers in this amazing piece, Time U.S. Leadership Woke Up to the New Economic Era, when he's the author of so much of the derivatives, what an amazing time to be alive and to have this Asia Pan Pacific trade pact that's secret that we can't even see. Uh, the Trans Pacific Partnership, I mean, this is everything you wrote about and went on Lou Dobbs about, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, Dr. Corsi, and got scoffed at. It's all coming true. I mean, this is amazing. Dr. Corsi, what's really going on geopolitically right now and what's happening? Uh, with this new investment bank? Well, a lot of what I did write about the late great USA, which was, you know, 10 years ago, is happening now. Uh, the, what you're reading about the Asian bank is just the prelude to the attempting to create fear. Larry Summers is out there saying, oh, we're losing to China. They're having their own investment bank. You're right. All these 
international banks are run by the same group of globalists. But the, the, the long-term plan is here Obama's going to come in now next and ask for fast-track authority to get this Trans-Pacific Partnership approved, another deal we don't know anything about that's been negotiated in secret. And the solution will be, oh, well, we have to have a supra-Pacific, not just NAFTA, we'll subsume NAFTA into a Pacific Rim NAFTA, and then we'll involve China, and this will be the solution to the fact that we're getting excluded from China's Asia Bank. So all Larry Summers is doing is trying to create fear so that the globalists can jam the next global solution down everybody's throat, which is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And I suspect we'll be seeing, now this is the prelude, very quickly, you know, the next crisis, the next manufactured news that the Obama administration will use to push the last crisis off the front page, which is, you know, Valerie Jarrett's been very good at manufacturing news so that nothing sticks, uh, will be this, we're losing to Asia, we're losing our global position, so we need a trans-Pacific partnership, which just gives more power to the globalists and less freedom and autonomy to the United States. And less jobs and more sure. of a planned, managed economy over and over again, which oh. you wrote about, I made films about, we've been talking about this for 20 years or longer, not because we're rocket scientists, but because it's an admitted plan. I mean, look at Europe having their leaders installed. You're predicting the EU breaks up. What do you, how do you see all this ending? Because what I've read from the Trilateral Commission plans that are public, and what Senator Goldwater talked about in some of the uh, secretive Senate meetings that he was in, this was openly discussed, they create three global unions, right. use those to suck dry the three unions, collapse those into one global super state run by private corporations that are anti-free market. Is that an accurate analysis? Yeah, I think so. I think also Russia wants to play, and Russia is going to, the breakup of the EU will not be a reduction of globalism. It won't be the individual countries going back to individual autonomy and self-governance. It'll be Russia coming in to bail out Greece. And as such, Russia will want to include Greece in its, its alignment. And you'll have a Russian union that stands outside the global union that China seems to be willing to agree to grow. To grow. I mean, China and Russia, they may both be communist states. They're not on the same side of the table. Russia's always been closer to Japan and aligned with Japan, even since World War II, uh, you know, when we ran merchant marine ships to lend lease to Russia and Japan let them go. Uh, Russia and Japan have been closely aligned. Russia and China are at odds. You're going to see an EU structure that, that weakens and gets pushed into the transatlantic alliance, while the trans-Pacific alliance is going to be advanced. And before you know it, will be in global governance again. And none of these global governances will have anything to do with freedom or the Bill of Rights or the Second Amendment or the First Amendment or the Fourth Amendment, because that in the cultural war attack that you're seeing from the left is also being eradicated and undermined by saying, well, if you don't agree with the LGBT agenda, you're a bigot. You know, you believe in Christianity. You're not only... If you want any type of borders and don't want to pay for everybody's free health care, you're a racist. If you don't want illegals voting, you're a racist. Just give in to our globalist agenda or you're a bad person. Because the fundamental order that has to be broken down that the left is now working aggressively to break down is the United States of America as supporting freedom, First Amendment, the Bill of Rights, our limited government, and being since the end of World War II, a power that could impose that kind of a moral business structure, a capitalist structure upon the world. That viewed as evil is being broken down and what will replace it is globalism. And under globalism, everybody start, better start reading George Orwell and and Aldous Huxley brave. That's right. Piratical combines that are the opposite of free market while scapegoating free market as what we're seeing under globalism. And producing 100 million people in the United States who are out of work, out of the labor force, and not needed. And in the, in the history of the world, when you know, the average person, when the middle class has been defined as not needed, Look out. you set up the perfect conditions for genocide, uh, for mass disease, for nuclear war. Because the, you'll find the globalists talking about there's just too many people in the world and they're useless. Uh, I mean, the 100 million people, one third of the U.S. population, 
you know, the working population, more than a third, not able to find a job and just basically economically. And they're setting up death panels and, and, and telling the yuppies how cool it is to kill your mom and dad. And then meanwhile, our videos up on DrudgeReport.com, UN Climate Change official says we should, quote, make every effort to depopulate the planet, close quote. Uh, the, the, there is pressure in the system to go towards that. We should do uh, everything possible to carry that out. I mean, these people are totalitarians. And when you look at Obama, I mean, I was a big critic of Bush, but my goodness, light speed opening the borders outside of law, light speed going after guns outside of law, light speed shutting down the power plants outside of law, light speed putting us under the UN, uh, illegal treaties. And then, like you said, totalitarian treaties that take Congre Congress's authority. This is classical usurping happening. But as long as they dress it up as trendy, it seems to be okay with a politically ignorant public. But there's still a larger minority becoming more and more aware. Uh, and as history shown, Dr. Corsi, if a large minority won't go along, no amount of tyranny can force it. What do you see in your crystal ball for the future of the confrontation by free humanity, true liberals, true Renaissance people versus the totalitarian leftist? Well, don't give up the Second Amendment. That's number one. And number two is that, you know, the middle class is being destroyed. Totalitarian governments push everything to the top. There's going to be a wealthy class, the ruling class at the top, and everybody else who are serfs, slaves. And that's where the left, that's where all of this globalism ends up. The George Soroses are not going to suffer. He'll have, you know, not one billion. Next, we'll be having trillionaires instead of billionaires. Concentration of wealth under Obama is growing. But also don't get confused to think that the Democrats and Republicans are two separate parties. You know, you've got an extension of the same kinds of principles that George W. Bush was pursuing, open borders, etc., just at a much rapid pace under Obama. And Obama was, you know, outright trained as a communist. Obama was raised as a Muslim. Obama is solidly in with the globalist agenda. And also don't get confused that he's for the people. He's done nothing for African Americans. He's done a lot for Wall Street. Concentration of wealth. Now wait a minute, he did double their unemployment. I mean, that was, and, yes, and put more of them in prison. So that's a nice thing to do. That, yes, that's right. But nothing positive. The, all the rhetoric, the, the communist rhetoric is just a rhetoric of control. It's a rhetoric of serfdom. It's now been introduced again under the Saul Linsky and Cloward Pivot of Obama because it's, the people were conditioned to be able, propaganda-wise, you know, to utilize the racist theme. If Hillary Clinton wins, it'll be the sexist theme. We're going to have another centrist Republican candidate on Jeb Bush being advanced. You know, and again, these leftist and rightist politicians are basically the two sides of the same. Sure, who do you like, Ted Cruz or Rand Paul more? I like them both, and either one of them would be worth supporting. And I hope that the two of them continue to advance, and I hope the two of them continue to, uh, sure. you know, they're going to have to fight the media. They're going to have to fight for campaign contributions. They're going to have to fight. And I think they should okay. own the yeah. fact that they're libertarian constitutionalists and not be ashamed of it. They should outright own it, and they should proclaim it and, uh, and argue for it. And they're, they're going to have to have grassroots support, though, because they will be shut out from the car by the Karl Robes from the... Republican You're established right. money, which will go to the Jeb Bush. Well, that's well. why you got to support them. The establishment's attacking them. It's a no-brainer. Dr. Corsi, thank you for all the time. WND.com. Look forward to speaking to you again soon. My great pleasure. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. What a smart guy on so many subjects. Uh, we'll be back with a news blitz straight ahead. I got a ton of it. And we'll play that UN clip calling for population reduction.